Next is about a torus of three members. Three members are fixed on the ceiling, allowing free rotation. The members are fixed at points A, B, and C. The lower part of the three members is fixed at point F that allows rotation exposed to the load P. You need to find the value of the displacement of point F. When a load P acts downward at this point F, the three members are stretched down together. Then the point F is moves downward. The cross section of the member is S. The length of the member is L. And the Young's modulus is E. The angles of AFB and CFB are both theta. As a flow of the solution to this problem, we start with defining the axial forces and loads acting on the three members as unknowns. Then, we determine the conditions between these unknowns and the external force P. This is the process for solving the problem. We define Q1 as the axial force acting on the left and right members and Q2 as the axial force acting on the center member. Then, as in the previous problem, we are writing down all the forces acting at the ring focusing on this joint point. Now, we are focusing on the external force P downward. When P acts, the member of the left, AF is pulled downward to the right. Then, we are considering the force applied to this joint point that is pulling the member AF. This point is pulled at Q1 in the opposite direction, which upwards to the left as a reaction force. The same is true for the material CF on the right side. The member CF is pulled downward to the left. At this connection point, the reaction force acts in the upper right direction at Q1. Since the structure in the problem is symmetrical, the reaction force is Q1 in both directions. As the problems we have solved so far statically determinate problems, these forces are balanced with P. In this case, there is another load Q2 acting on the central torus PF. Similar to the other members, the force acting on the joint, the point of a ring is upward. So, in the illustration, Q2 is shown as an upward load. Since the structure in the problem is symmetrical, we do not need to consider the horizontal balance of forces. We can solve this problem by considering only the balance of forces in the vertical direction. The vertical component of the force on the right member is Q1 cosine theta. The same is true for the left member. The upward force applied to the joint is the sum of the forces applied to the left, right, and center members. The first equation is the sum of these forces, 2q1 cosine theta and q2, is balanced with the downward external force P. Now, we can derive the elongations for the each members by using the axial forces on the members. Since the members 
on both sides are located symmetrically, the elongation of them both is lambda 1. Here, the elongation is the product of strain and the length of the member. The strain is the Young's modulus divided by the stress. The stress is the cross-section area divided by the actual force. Using these relationships, the elongation of the two members of the left and right, lambda 1 is given by the equation. We perform the equivalent process for the member BF. The elongation lambda 2 is the product of the strain and the length of the member. The strain is expressed as the Young's modulus divided by the stress. And the stress is expressed as the axial force divided by cross-section area. Following the procedure, we define the elongation of the center member, lambda 2, as the equation. At the end, we consider the relationship among the elongations. It is exactly equivalent to solution of the previous problem. We consider the state in which the original member CF has been extended by lambda 1 and shifted in parallel. The original F is shifted to the position of F dash. Since the member CF is very long, we can approximate that the point F comes on a perpendicular line down from CF to CF dash. And then, the member CF is approximated to be stretched by lambda 1. The member BF is stretched vertically downward by lambda 2. The procedure is equivalent to the previous problem. CF dash, which is the member CF, after the elongation, is approximated to be parallel to CF. Considering these, we get right angle triangles. The angles at the edges of the triangle is theta. So, we get the relationship between the elongation lambda 1 and lambda 2, as lambda 2 cosine theta is equal to lambda 1. Now, we substitute the values obtained from the axial forces, which have been calculated from Q1 and Q2 before, into these lambda 1 and lambda 2. This gives us the equation for the relationship between Q1 and Q2 as the equation. Then, associating this relationship with the equation about the three laws, we obtain Q1 and Q2, which are originally unknown values as follows. Once you have the load, we just can follow the standard procedure. You should divide the load by the cross-section area to get the stress. Divide the stress by the Young's modulus to get the strain. And then, multiply the strain by the length of the member, L, to get the elongation. In this problem, we focus on the center member, BF, to find the displacement at the point of loading. The displacement of the member, BF, is defined as the equation. In this problem, the axial forces, Q1 and Q2, acting on the members cannot be determined only with the balance of the forces. So, this problem is a statically indeterminate problem. The approach in problem solving is equivalent to the previous problems. Using the condition of deformation, the balance between external and axial forces we find two values of the three forces, 
the axial forces acting on the members on both sides and the center member. This is how to analyze the structure deformation in this problem.